we we hear you and um and apparently you have been promoted <laughs> that's an interesting term to use Bonnie gives us the green light. I can start. Okay, yeah. Chelsea, you are good to go. Awesome. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, good afternoon. It's May 2nd, and I'm calling the order um, the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. We have a quorum of uh, Jasmine, Suzanne, myself, and Jeffrey, and Zach. Um, I'm going to get the agenda out. All right. <laughs> so, um, it's good to be in person again. I encourage everyone at all the meetings to be in person to be um, great to see your face, Jasmine. And I know it's kind of back there close by if they're there. So next time if you guys see around, that'd be great. But I know we all have obligations. Um, anyway, uh, to start the public meeting, I'd like to open the floor to commissioners who have any comments about um, items that are not on the agenda. Um, so if anyone has anything to add or discuss amongst uh, us, go ahead, commissioners. Or, yeah. And Joe is joining us. If there's no comments from commissioners, then that and this is the first meeting. I would open the floor to any members of the public. So Matt, Daddy Clapper, or Steve Charles? Joe, or of course. Um, any members of the public who are in attendance who would like to discuss anything that's not on the agenda today, I'd let them be heard. Bonnie, anybody? Wanna... We do. We do have a Jill, um, Abella. And the 819-248-7799 number, if either of you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand. It's at the bottom of the screen or push star six. We'll give you a minute. Bill spelled off the cockpit number. Uh, seeing as though there's no hands raised, Bonnie, I think we'll, we'll go on the next. Um, okay. Uh, um, so in the, before we get to our public hearing, uh, is there any members of the planning staff uh, that would like to discuss anything that we don't already have on the agenda tonight? Suzanne, do you... Oh, we have a card for anyone to sign for Monty, um, thanking him. Cool. Um, and uh, Jeffrey had an idea for us, a little gift we could give him, so that's a good one. Um, but other than that, meeting-wise, right now, nothing scheduled for May 16th. Um, I'll let you know if that changes. June 6th will be the community growth advisory. advisory committee. I was like, I can do this. Um, presentation to the PNB and the BOCC joint meeting. So that'll be a four o'clock meeting um, for you all. Um, I don't know that we figured out. I think they were thinking about trying to move that to the library to have a bigger mm -hmm. space um, to right. accommodate everybody, but we'll obviously let you know. Are we going to talk about that tonight? Mm -hmm. Is that on the agenda yeah. um, it's not on the agenda tonight. Um, right now, I mean, the committee has finished its meetings, is going to review its final report on the 17th. The, the, that report will then be presented. So, yeah, I've been there um, for 18 meetings now. Um, <laughs> The 19 tomorrow when we count the affordable housing. So I'd like to make a couple comments on that. I don't know if staff can, you know, pull something together for the people that are on the PNZ that um, you know that haven't been attending. I know uh, Chelsea has been, Suzanne has been, and and uh, so I think there's some really exciting concepts that are in there. Um, I think there's, you know, a lot of great stuff that's happened over the last nine months with that process. Um, and I also think that the issues are like super complicated. They're largely interlinked to each other and there's, you know, a lot to digest. So, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, they, you know, they've got, I think a, a summary report that, that came out of the last meeting, but maybe not, maybe it's just a memo. The last memo would be <clears throat> helpful to PNZ members if you want to just go on the website under the growth committee link. And there's all the packets and the packet from the last meeting. I don't know if it's been updated, but it addresses a lot of the topics that we've gone through, including putting in FAR uh, calculations in all the zone districts, 
um, you know, major changes to the, the TDR program, potential concept for residential TDRs, um, concept of overlays um, that are based on proximity to infrastructure and, you know, how that weighs in to square footage and so on and so forth. But there's uh, there's a ton of stuff to, 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 to digest. And I just would urge everybody to you know, just take a look at it and, and see some of the stuff that's in there because uh, it's going to be, a, I think, a very interesting discussion and, uh, and you know, kind of exciting in terms of some concepts they've come up with. Some are maybe not so exciting, but and, there's a lot there. And it's not, um, it's not final yet, is it? Until we have one more meeting. Right, when they will see their the final their okay. final report and, okay. and I guess give it their blessing essentially to to go to go forward. And I'm happy to send you the link to that site for those of you who may not have had an opportunity to look at it if you're interested in reviewing it, uh, all the documentation that's included there. But also, I'm assuming we will have some. I'm hoping we'll have some sort of memo or document uh, that we will be able to send to you before the joint P and Z meeting, P and Z and Board of County Commissioners meeting on June 6th, so that you have some time to absorb some information uh, before we sit down together. I, I can't promise that that will be available, but I think that's our intent, if we can pull it off. So um, yeah, it's a lot of um, very detailed and interesting uh, information that will come forward to you. Yeah, thanks for raising that, Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is coming down the pipeline for all of us at P and Z, so best to be prepared and read in advance because uh, there's a lot. Um, well, then, uh, well, I think it's time to get to the next agenda item. Um, as part of our public hearing, uh, we're going to hear from Ellen, who's going to present um, the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus Master Plan in a minute. So, thank, yeah, thank you, Chelsea. So, for those who may be listening who don't know me, I'm Ellen Sassano. I'm the Long Range, sorry, oh, the Long Range Planning Administrator for the county. And Tim Malloy is joining us virtually, and he is the planning consultant who has worked with the county assisting us in updating uh, several of the caucus master plans over the past couple of years. And, and he and I will be tag teaming our presentation. So to be clear for all who may be watching, tonight's meeting is a notice public hearing to take action on a resolution of the Pickham County Planning and Zoning Commission adopting amendments to the 2018 Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus Master Plan and certifying the master plan to the Board of County Commissioners. And staff has recommended that the PNZ take action tonight to approve that attached resolution and certify the plan to the board. Tim and I are gonna speak briefly uh, to the process involved in adopting master plans. S several of you have done this before, some may not have. So we'll, we'll walk through process, and provide a, a brief presentation of the proposed changes in the master plan since it was last adopted in 2018. <clears throat> and then after uh, caucus input, if there is any, uh, and, and planning commission discussion, any public comment that we may have uh, <clears throat> as part of the public hearing, the PNZ um, may take action tonight to vote on this resolution. Uh, or as an alternative may, if there are issues that need to be further discussed or resolved, uh, another alternative is to continue the public hearing to a date certain. And if we get there, um, we can talk about a specific date. So again, uh, I just want to walk through a little, a little bit further through process. I know several of you are familiar with the process, but for those who might not be, uh, the it, the, this process uh, started with the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus Board working with uh, caucus citizens to amend uh, this master plan. Um, it, it was last amended in 2018 and adopted by the PNZ. 
And a lot of work has gone into this update and uh, it's much appreciated. By state statute, the, the P and Z has the authority to review and adopt master plans subject to a public hearing. And for the final authority, uh, once you have taken action on this plan, then the, the plan will be moved forward to the Board of County Commission and uh, Board of County Commissioners and certified. Basically, the purpose of that action is just to inform them uh, about the, the plan amendment and update. Uh, they, they will take no formal action. It's really just an informational item for them. So with that, uh, beyond process, let's let's jump into the to the plan amendments themselves, but let's start with with the plan area map, which is, I don't know how well you can read it, but Tim is just going to walk us through the what this caucus area um, looks like. Um, when you mentioned that uh, you're having trouble seeing it, Elle, is it small or? I, th I, th I think it's, I think, what are you planning commissioners? Can, is this legible? It was in your packet. It was legible in the packet. It was legible in the packet. Yeah. Is it blurry on the screen or something? I'm not sure if I can do anything about that, but. Can you perhaps make it a little bit bigger, Tim? Yeah, let's see if we can do that. Lose the planning area description if that happens when you make it bigger. I can resize it. Oops, but not that way. 5,750 square feet. How's that? Is that any better? <laughs> you know, I I think I'd just move forward. At your verbal description will will probably okay. get where we need to go. Thanks. Well, so here is a map of the planning area, which contains about 17,000 acres. Um, this is a largely rural area of the county, and I don't have to mention to any of you who live there um, how beautiful this area is with. Um, the large tracts of um, agricultural lands, the monastery, um, Capitol Creek and Snowmass Creek and the, the beautiful riparian areas that um, are adjacent to those creeks. The zoning in this area uh, continues to support rural. It's mostly RS30 and rural and remote with a few smatterings of, of uh, AR2 and R30, that being the, the uh, gateway to Old Snowmass and Little Oak Creek subdivisions and a few other uh, small AH zone districts, et cetera. Um, it is uh, also the home of the um, Capitol Creek Trailhead and the Benedict, the St. Benedict Monastery, the Aspen Camp School for the Deaf. Um, and the only commercial uses are located out at the Highway 82 and Snowmass Creek Road where there's the post office Conoco Station, the old Snowmass Market Deli and the Snowmass Ranch Liquor Store. Right, and I, I will just add to that briefly that uh, since the upper Snowmass Creek Caucus divided from what used to be the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus as a whole, uh, this area now includes lower Snowmass Creek Road rather than the entirety of, Snow, of Snowmass Creek Road. Just wanted to clarify that. Go ahead, Tim. So uh, this is a list of the categories um, that the plan is divided into, and um, all of the all of the policies fall into these topical areas. The ones that are highlighted here um, are sort of the key ones where the most changes have occurred, and they're the ones that we'll focus on the most. Um, the plan has also been uh, reorganized. Um, and to highlight key topics and some of the policies from the 2018 plan have been um, moved to other more appropriate topical areas. And we won't really go through a lot of those changes. Uh, mostly we'll be focusing on new policies and policies that have been sort of significantly um, amended. A couple of examples of, of uh, things that have been relocated is the environmental stewardship um, category, which had been named uh, environmental, um, what was it called? Natural environment section um, has been sort of, a bunch of the policies have been sort of distributed over several other um, sections because they were related more closely to these other sections. 
So um, we'll move on with the first of the significant changes, which is the residential development section. Right, thanks. So the residential development section includes some timely recommendations for land use code amendments, particularly given the work that the Community Growth Advisory Committee has been tasked with to address growth management through the lens of climate change. Uh, so for those of you uh, planning commissioners who've been attending those meetings, you'll see some, some actions here that actually reflect the conversation that the that growth committee has been having. Uh, the first arrow uh, identifies a recommendation that single family homes be of a size and bulk that's compatible with the size of the lot. That's something that the growth committee has been discussing. Uh, and then there is a recommendation and this is really a, a key recommendation in terms of the update and the plan, uh, that the, the maximum house size cap of 8250, which exists in the Snowmass Capital Creek caucus, caucus today, be reduced to 5,750 square feet. At the same time, uh, the recommendation recognizes uh, that there are existing land use applications or, or uh, approvals out there for homes larger than 5750 and 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 the recommendation is that those approvals be honored uh and and uh so this is a a pretty significant change um uh, and it would it would absolutely require a, a an amendment to the land use code probably in the format of a, of a zoning overlay right so let's move move through these, and then um, I'd I'd like to respond to questions when when we get get through them. Were you done with that, Sylvia? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, okay. So uh, one of the ways that um, this section has been changed is that there have been some changes to the list of uh, review criteria. And in the prior plan, the review criteria applied only to TDR receiver sites. And now that language has been changed so that it would apply to all development or redevelopment. And a few of the significant um, standards that have been added are listed below here where we see um, visual impacts are now identified specifically from the major roads, Snowmass Creek Road, C Capital Creek Road, and East Sopers Creek Road, and the parcels that adjoin those. And there's also um, an emphasis on um, valuing dark skies. And so there have been some policy changes related to um, requiring strict adherence to the county's lighting code, et cetera. And also we see um, that there, there's a policy that talks about supporting net zero consumption um, for all new and remodeled houses. So, and, and I'll just add to that, that there's been a lot of discussion in the community as a whole in the, in the county about dark skies. Uh, of late and and the dark sky initiative uh, and the fact that the I don't believe the county has any uh, any areas that have been designated as designated as dark sky communities but it's something that the board of county commissioners is interested in and so this this may help support some direction there and then uh, relative to the the last bullet here again I'm, I just want to point out that net zero energy consumption is something another item that the growth committee uh, has has been talking about and supported, as has the board of county commissioners for for several years now. So, um, just wanted to give some background there. So then, this, there are there are also some um, standards recommendations for revisions to standards that really relate uh, to to uh, protection of wildlife. And um, one is, it relates to fencing, uh, a recommendation for fencing that is more wildlife friendly. And uh, there's a recommendation uh, to prohibit highly reflective windows. And I think this is about uh, the fact that birds fly into, uh, fly into, I'm not quite, I, in any case, I think this, I believe this one also relates to wildlife. And then there is also recommendation, um, a recommendation pertaining to flood development in the floodplain, again, trying to protect wetlands and riparian areas, uh, again, which are so critical to the to wildlife habitat. So 
So this next, uh, this next slide uh, <clears throat> contains recommendations for amending the land use code to either allow certain uses subject to special review or to prohibit them. Uh, this is acknowledging the fact that uses are continually changing and, uh, and, the, and the caucus wants to make sure that uh, there are changes made to this section of the land use code to adapt to physical, cultural, socioeconomic changes that are occurring around us. And so in the left-hand column, again, this isn't huge, but uh, there, are, there are recommendations for changes to uses uh, that the caucus believes should be only allowed within the caucus area as special review uses. And I've hi highlighted the, the changes that have been made since the 2018 master plan. So now there's, there's the inclusion of wind turbines, uh, hydroelectric production, and, uh, and um, cultivation of now it's saying controlled substances rather than just marijuana. And as well as seasonal and, and permanent employee housing. Again, several of these are things that the growth committee is grappling with, the board of county commissioners has been grappling with. So these recommendations um, I think will be helpful uh, in, in supporting direction moving forward. And clearly the, the wind turbines and hydroelectric relate directly to climate and uh, the, the seasonal housing uh, the permanent and seasonal housing is something that is is you know front and center right now in the community as far as a discussion that's being had. And uh, actually, Chelsea asked me earlier prior to the meeting how this would be implemented in the land use code. And uh, I mentioned earlier that it, the the thinking is that in order to implement the house size cap reduction, uh, the 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 cleanest tool in the land use code uh, would be a zoning overlay. So there would have to be a land use code amendment um, to to change zoning. And in an overlay district, we would address house size. We would address new standards uh, and including uses um, uses and other uh, standards that, that this plan recommends that would be specific to the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus area. We have done that in the past uh, when the Frying Pan Caucus recommended a, a reduction in maximum house size and when the Maroon Creek Caucus did the same. So this, this has been done before and will, will be the, the path that we would take in the event that Planning Commission and Board wanna move forward with these recommendations. So there have been relatively few changes to the roads and transportation section of the plan. A couple of them are listed here. Apparently there's been some concern about the safety of horseback riders on area roads. So that has been added as a concern. And also um, there's been, uh, there's a concern about tree removal on county land, including right of way um, and requiring caucus review for that tree removal, even if it's for safety reasons. I think uh, Ellen's um, recommendation in the in the um, memo to you is that this be um, suggested as opposed to required. But at any rate, that's how it's read. And there's one other one also that um, adds a policy seeking support from the county sheriff and road and bridge for preventing overnight parking on county roads and limiting parking at the end of Capitol Creek Road where the trailheads are. And yeah, and as you know, these this area is heavily used for recreational purposes, and those roads um, are well loved and used. So most of these recommendations are are trying to gra again grapple with with the the heavy use and making sure that users are safe uh, and that the rural character of those roads is maintained at the same time. So again, recreation and tourism um, are are. Uh, uh, are definitely an element in this caucus area as it is surrounded by public lands and wilderness and contains trailhead, the Capitol Creek trailhead, as, as Tim said earlier. Uh, so trying to address that use, uh, there, there are two recommendations that have been added here. One is again relating to safety, uh, specifically at the T intersec intersection of Highway 82 uh, and Snowmass and Capitol Creek roads. 
Um, and then there are also, again, because this caucus is surrounded by federal lands uh, and some wilderness, there's a, a recommendation which is unique, um, I think. I haven't seen it before, but it's suggesting that where there is uh, development on private lands, that the site planning uh, include buffer zones where it is adjacent to, for example, a wilderness area, so that there's some continuity and there's not just a hard line between development and these, these um, open public lands. And we're, we're getting through this. I'm just gonna let the bear speak for this one. <laughs> he is licking his, he or she is licking chops. So that's not a good sign. <laughs> He's just saying, lovely snack. Let's let's not have me for dinner all the time, lest I be carted off to a wilderness. Right. So <clears throat> the next slide uh, speaks to noise pollution, and uh, this hasn't changed a lot from the previous from the 2018 plan, but uh, it does it does address special events and making sure that regulations are addressing things like. Uh, noise levels that exceed a certain decibel um, and timely response to neighbors' complaints. Uh, it also uh, speaks to firearms and um, I and discharge of automatic and semi-automatic firearms and, and use of tracer rounds. So, uh, and the, the upper portion, the first arrow uh, relates to prohibitions on fireworks, drones, loud music, New air, aircraft landing strips and, and, and vertical take takeoff landing pads. So again, most of this was included, as I recall, in the 2018 plan, but there's a need to reiterate uh, the need to address noise pollution here. And I would just point out that this is one of those sections where a lot of these policies were moved from that now defunct natural environment section. So there are some new ones, but a lot of them were just relocated from that um, old section. Uh, here again, uh, this, uh, the section, the policies in the water section were actually combined from two prior sections, water use and water resources from the 2018 plan. But there were some additions, including this policy um, that was added to the A4 set, set of policies that supports voluntary actions, voluntary actions to transfer water rights to protect in-stream flows. And then this, um, the policy that has the state-of-the-art low flow plumbing fixtures being removed. And I'd like to add here that the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus has been a leader on the water front, so to speak, <laughs> for years. And uh, yeah, and they continue to refine their recommendations relating to water consumption and stream stream health. Uh, and it's it's they've got beautiful waterways uh, within the caucus area, and they are very attuned to to that uh, to that element and and continue to be leaders. So uh, much appreciated there. And Sue Helm, who provided us with this image back in 2003 when we did the initial plan there, was one of the leaders of that push. So this next uh, section on energy use, uh, it's, an, it's a section that's been added to several of our master plans as they've been updated. And this, again, is in great alignment with the work that the uh, the Community Growth Advisory Committee is doing, uh, and uh, it supports consideration of community solar and microgrids to make the area more resilient. And it's, which I be, I don't remember if this was included as part of the Brush Creek, I don't think it was included as part of the Brush Creek plan, but it's, it's really oh. an important element, and I'm glad to see it here. So next we have the climate section, which is new uh, to this plan. And this is um, a section which you, I think, saw uh, with the Brush Creek plan where um, a lot of policies that were not exactly uh, the policies that you see in this plan, but had a similar intent uh, were included. And um, this is something that we've been including in all of the plans as we've moved them through the process. And um, 
one of the keys here is encouraging homeowners to understand climate vulnerabilities, um, issues associated with methane and greenhouse gases, and taking proactive uh, steps to sort of be their own kind of um, set up their own sort of climate resilience. Um, and then we have these uh, three specific um, policies, which I'm not going to read, but are related to mitigation, stewardship, and regeneration. Um, steward, stewardship has to do with homeowners weatherizing and electrifying their homes, doing things like um, electronic vehicles, setting up charging stations, um, batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And regeneration is um, exploring how your land can be um, climate positive by doing things like um, you know, planting native plants, gardening, et cetera. So, so the next section is uh, on, on wildfire, which is something we're all be becoming very familiar with, unfortunately. And uh, basically, it the, there's a recommendation that acknowledges the importance uh, that controlled burns play in mitigating catastrophic wildfire events. So um, that's 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 the gist of this of this section, uh, which I believe existed in the 2018 plan as well. But this just brings it up to date. And one of the last sections is the new environmental stewardship. And this is the section that's been kind of rearranged from various other sections. Uh, there are a lot of new policies, however, in this section that address pets control, uh, the use of the biodiversity surveys in uh, the review of development applications, um, things like rewilding, um, you know, planting native grasses instead of lawns, et cetera, um, wildlife fencing, and protecting beaver ponds, et cetera. Um, one of the specific items that's addressed here is the Roaring Fork Biodiversity Study, which has been in the works for the last, I think, two and a half years. And this study was finished last September uh, and is released and is available on, uh, the final report is available on the internet now at, their, at the um, Roaring Fork uh, Initiatives website. And we've obtained the, the final study as well as uh, the GIS data that was built on. And we're currently in the process of studying how we can incorporate sort of the best and brightest of the findings um, in the master plans and potentially uh, for consideration, perhaps in some code amendments at some future date. But that's exciting information because that report is, is well done and it provides far more sort of finely grained information with respect to wildlife habitat, et cetera, than does the current um, CPW mapping, for example, although it does rely on that mapping. Um, and, again, oh, go ahead, El. No, finish, sorry. Uh, and so uh, the lawn space reduction slash rewilding and wildlife corridors um, are the other two, and there are several key wildlife corridors in this area for both mule deer and elk. Um, that uh, allow the animals to pass between the important habitats uh, that exist both in this caucus area and the caucus and the uh, federal lands to the west. Yeah, I was just going to add that that the uh, that the Roaring Fork Biodiversity Study is another is another subject that the Board of County Commissioners has recently expressed a lot of interest in and and hoping to incorporate it in in. Uh, our review of site plans and, and, and in our land use reviews. So uh, hopefully we'll be able, we may even be able to bring that, that study forward to you and to the Board of County Commissioners just as, as an information piece, uh, because I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, work um, incorporated in that, in that study. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to um, take questions. I don't know if, if the caucus members who are um, present online have any input. Um, and uh, I'll just ask if the caucus yeah. or invite them to comment. And we'll need to open up the public hearing. So. In order for the caucus members to comment? Uh, no. Oh, okay.
Because she'll like the applicant, I think. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, not necessarily. I mean, I think if they're presenting part of the plan, there may be additional people who've joined in, but. Um, and both Tim and Ellen have a great presentation. Um, and uh, since the caucus did so much work putting you know these new um, amendments in place or presenting them to us with you, the caucus members who are on our screen today would like to chime in. By all means, they're they're welcome to add thoughts and feedback. David or Michael. So uh, I'd like to make uh, about. Uh, Four, just offer four quick notes and one uh, particular comment. Uh, first note is on the TDR and house size. As contrasted to virtually everything else in the master plan, which was just uh, done by unanimous consent and uh, discussion, uh, those two were debated at length often and repeatedly before we came up with a language that you see in the plan. So just a note that that was, and as some of you may recall that those issues were, were in 2018, what caused the two caucuses to separate. Right. Actually, the commissioners caused them to separate in particular, but that's what caused the upper snowmass folks to, to desire to, to separate. Uh, second point is that we just FYI, we are seeking dark sky designation. Uh, third, uh, I'm going to note that that some, and this is probably obvious to a lot of you all, is that some of the language uh, in in the uh, in the plan are suggestions to our neighbors and are not direct um, appeals to the P and Z per se. Uh, and yeah. Uh, and the fourth point is, um, and there are there are also, also in the plan some concerns that we are offering to the county more broadly, not just to the P and Z. And one example is that is the place in which I'd like to add a particular comment, and that is with regard to tree cutting, and that goes to a particular event last summer where uh, I interrupted uh, the road and bridge crew as it was about to kill, cut down about a dozen or more mature cottonwoods right on Snowmass Creek, ostensibly because it was causing a traffic hazard. I think that that question was debatable, but we wanted to be in a position to be part of that debate. So that's why we think that proposals to cut down trees should be required to go, not requested to go to the to the caucus. Now we're not saying that, that we have veto power. We're just saying that uh, it's it's reasonable uh, expectation for us to um, require that uh, that. And notice that that uh, it says the county also says the county would seek approval from the caucus that. It doesn't necessarily need to secure approval in order to go ahead. We we understand that we are no more than an advisor, <clears throat> an informal in, in, well, a formal advisory entity. So those are my only comments, and my neighbors may have other additional comments. I'd like to um, uh, suggest that Michael's comment that that the caucus is. Uh, going for uh, a dark sky designation through the International Dark Sky Association located in Tucson uh, is an important step for us uh, and one where we hope to take some leadership within the county as a, uh, as a whole. Um, secondly, I, I would also um, uh, comment that the everyone is is very uh pleased with the idea of limiting house sizes to 5750 and mm -hmm. to uh and to uh not, uh doing away with the TDR issue I mean, th th those are important steps for this group and we're very glad to put that forth Thanks, David. 
Anybody else in the caucus that would like to provide comments in support of staff presentation? I do have a Jill on the line. Um, I have asked her to unmute, but she has not. Jill, do you have anything you would like to comment on? There. Can, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Well, well, I'm 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 very happy with what Michael and David both said, and I think it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Do you all see me also, Chelsea Brundage? Yes. Or hear me or whatever you get on that end. Thank you for, um, Tim, I think you did a great job summarizing the changes in that plan, having participated in both, both versions and earlier versions. Um, and in addition to what Michael, what the others have already said, I think um, it's important to call attention of the county to our concern and attention to the use and overuse of the Capitol Creek Trailhead and the Hay Park Trailhead, which are both in our caucus area. And we have had um, complaints, lots of observations from um, neighbors about um, really congested and unsanitary conditions at the Capitol Creek Trailhead. And I know that those are open space and other parties or forest service are looking at that. We also had lots of concerns raised about the Hay Park Trailhead, people trying to um, get beyond that in the winter and get up the Capitol Creek Road in the winter. So I think in our recommendations about signage at Hay Park and um, no parking or camping on the roads were all, our, all of our efforts to think through how to make sure that that, um, overuse and and sort of unthoughtful use of public roads doesn't happen so um, there may be examples from other master plans that are useful to us but that has been something we've paid a lot of attention to um, I think the energy and climate um, additions and enhancements that Sierra Flanagan among other people have really brought to the master plan really deserve applause. There's been a lot of work and education of our in our neighborhood to bring us all along. And um, it's kind of exciting to be part of a neighborhood community that is sort of eager to eager to learn and get better and better at these things. And I guess finally I'd say I think the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus and the larger caucus, when it was still the larger caucus, have tried to be um, really forward thinking about the stewardship of waters in Capitol Creek and Lower Snowmass Creek in the old days, also Snowmass Creek. Um, we are really invested in understanding how Capitol Creek works, how um, current obviously legal irrigation practices in the summer tend to dewater that creek in certain reaches and what we can do as neighbors and stewards to manage irrigation with water withdrawals and the timing of things to enhance flows. We've invested in um, a really state-of-the-art decision support system modeling project that Loda Hydrologic did for us in 2021 maybe um, to uh, really decipher how that creek works and look for opportunities where we could do some gauging and data gathering to try to sort of defend the minimum in-stream flows at least for that creek. It's important because there have been some applications for the construction and filling of ponds um, in our caucus area recently that um, would um, involve withdrawals from the creek in violation, I'm not trying to use that in a threatening way, but in ways that exceed the creek's ability to also maintain a minimum in-stream flow, which is a flow right held by the CWCB. So we've been getting smart and getting involved in the stream management issues out there as well, and certainly welcome people's input on the water section or things we can be doing or ways the county wants to engage around those issues because there are several streams in our 
Upper Roaring Fork watershed that have in-stream flow rights and many jurisdictions that have some response and nonprofits that have some responsibility or take some responsibility around the maintenance of those in-stream flow rights. This climate change increases and streams get warmer and water is shallower and warmer. There's a question about whether there's gonna be enough water in, to maintain those creeks at the level that's implied by their current minimum in-stream flows. So those water issues and, and the health of the creeks are really important things for us in the, and our neighborhood group did a lot of work in trying to lean into that in this version of the plan as well. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, before I open the public hearing, um, I believe that uh, I would invite the PNZ commissioners to ask questions of staff and the caucus members in attendance um, for clarification about anything that's contained in the memo or the um, presentation that we've reviewed today and other materials. So, um, Zach and Jasmine, we'll start with you since you're online. Do you guys have any questions um, or comments? Not for me, thank you. Yeah, I don't have anything right now. All right, Suzanne, did you wanna ask any questions? Yes. Um, the, does this deal with um, special event venues? Yes. How those, who said yes? Ah, okay. okay. Michael or staff, you want to answer? Do they have questions? It, it's in there. I don't have the language in front of me. Uh, Ellen, if you could refer. I have it, I think. Yeah, it's particu particularly with, re with respect to um, uh, noise levels and, and lights like that. Mm -hmm. In the community growth meetings of last week, um, there was a discussion about the difference between a special event being approved and then being declared a special review venue, a, a special event venue, and those apparently are, are different, and it sounded like the special event venue um, binds that the person who owns that property to a pretty strict set of regulations all the time. Um, Ron, can you tell me any more about that? I'll jump in. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, so I'm probably on it. Ron's tap me on that one. So yes, I mean, right, similar conversation last week. So a special event venue requires a special review approval by the BOCC public hearing, ends up with very specific limitations on how many events, the hours, you know, traffic, parking, all of those kinds of things. Um, we don't have very many of them in the county. The one we talked about a little bit last week was the um, the Flying Dog Ranch Barn on Prince Creek Road. Mm -hmm. It was approved years ago as basically an event facility um, with a lot of conditions on it. Um, so that's a special event venue under the code. We also have what's allowed is essentially temporary uses, special event permits. Um, where any property can come in and ask for up to three a year under a special event permit. Um, we, you know, ask them to provide us with, you know, their site plan, the safety plan, those kinds of things. We refer those to the caucuses. Those are not publicly noticed. The neighbors do not re receive, you know, public notice of those other than through the caucus referral process. Um, so those go through and we issue a special event permit for those. So I guess your question is also would also be similar to mine is a clarification of if the caucus had that sort of more nuanced conversation about event venues versus the opportunity for individual properties to be able to go through that just special event permit and, process as well. And I clearly I'd like the caucus to respond, but my reading of of the plan suggests that the recommendations, which include prohibition of noise levels exceeding 60 decibels at the property line after 11 p.m., providing notice of the event to neighbors well prior to the event, and timely response to neighbors' complaints. Um, I think those are referring to, to the temporary use permits, those types of special events, and not specifically to special event venues. That's correct. 
it. Yeah. Okay. And we didn't we didn't distinguish between uh, that I recall between those two categories in our conversations. I think some of us, like me, were ignorant of the the venue category. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it's easy to assume that the, the the constraints that we suggest apply in both cases. They they do, Michael, and and to my knowledge, there's been no requests for a venue as opposed to just simply a, a, a temporary. temporary. Yeah. But there is no language in the plan that's specific to a venue. No, that's correct. We probably ought to add that for our own purposes. Yeah, maybe. It, given that we want this thing to be, we hope that it's read by our neighbors, especially our new neighbors, <laughs> which may be naive, but we hope. My, my, my sense is that, that um, we would not want to establish a venue, mm -mm. Uh, and therefore I would put uh, a prohibition uh, uh, of that in that list of um, things that require review and things that yeah. uh, do not that we, we will not accept. That's a good idea. Right in that chart. I think it's reasonable for the P and Z to assume that David's suggestion would be easily a unanimous consent on the part of the caucus board. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I have a question, a follow-up question on that for Rai. If that change was to the prohibition to special event uses within the caucus area <clears throat> were to be made tonight, would we have to continue the public hearing to acknowledge that change or could, is that an insignificant enough change so that the, the PNZ could take action tonight and, and allow that change to be made? I think the PNZ can take action. The PNZ is the body that is charged with making the master plan or adopting the plan for the specific planning area. So if the PNZ votes on that, I think they're good to go tonight. Thank and, you. And so that's not just special event, that's the venue. Question. Yes, that's correct, Suzanne, yeah. And that would come forth when we write an overlay zone district, Right. then that would show up as a prohibited use, which then obviously could have discussion point as a proposed code amendment. Yeah. In, a, in a public area. I'm just following Ryan's line of thinking for reasons we can take action if, based on this change is because it's recommendation in nature only. Yeah, so, it, sorry, would require, it would require a code. Sure. Land use. There's going to be a land use code text amendment or and more importantly a zoning action mm -hmm. in front of this body. Then that needs to be noticed in advance yeah. in the specific zoning action the board is going to have in front of them would need to be laid out with specificity. Okay. Yeah, who carries the water on that then? When will it come up or does the, the caucus have to ask for staff to prepare a well, amendment? I think Suzanne can outline sort of the process when the Maroon Creek master plan overlay was done. Um, with Maroon Creek, yeah, I mean, when it after we did the master plan amendment, um, the conversation was what staff's capacity to move this forward and write the overlay, um, which I think everybody kind of gets is we're a little tapped out. Um, so in that case, the um, the Maroon Creek caucus um, did hire someone to basically write the overlay that was then basically handed off to staff to you know, finalize and take through the process. So the caucus did, I guess, lift the weight on that one to actually take the language from their master plan to draft the overlay for then staff to, to move forward. So it basically helped get it happening sooner rather than later um, at that point. But, but yeah, so there's that step of needing to draft it is what does it take to amend the code to accomplish these things? Um, and then bringing that through that full code amendment process. Okay. Thanks. And in lieu of the caucus hiring someone to draft the amendment, then staff would draft the amendment, but the timing would might be such that it could be 
a long ways off. Did you hear yeah. that, David, Michael, and Chelsea? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that's your water to carry. And a lot of it depends on the, the extent to which the zoning action or the land use code amendment is um, to the extent that like how much of the plan you're looking to implement. Yeah. If you're just doing a 5750 overlay and that's it, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, it, and it could be that these amendments, yeah, are moved forward piecemeal to the extent that it makes sense to move in that direction. So, yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Do you have any other comments? I do. Um, when, when, why did you remove uh, the the state of the art, the requirement for the state of the art um, low flow plumbing fixtures? Uh, I don't think we removed that. Uh, I don't. I don't recall that. That's been a removal. It, it is. Uh, well, let me see. Whatever. <laughs> is that in the water section? Section 12. A previous yeah. recommendation encouraging homeowners to install state of the art low flow plumbing fixtures has been removed. You know, Tim picked that up in comparing the two plans, and it could be that it was just inadvertently. I think that might be what happened. Yeah. I I can't imagine our group. I think what we did, we did a major reorganization of the plan. And we, as somebody observed earlier, we had a lot of stuff in different sections and then tried to sort of get smart about where things went. So I think we had that domestic water efficiency issue under the water section and then came to revise the plan. So the water section really speaks more to sort of outdoor water, environmental water, and the residential development sections would speak to um, residential water use. And it may be that that piece didn't transfer over. I'm gonna take a quick look. Although the word efficient should be, should replace the word low flow, which turns people away, same effect. Um, the, the, the policy about removal of the trees, Michael, you were saying that you wanted it, or that you all had wanted it to say required. I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And instead, it's now saying encourage. What, why did, who, who removed required? I, I, no, we, we kept required. Yeah, I, um, explain. I'll, I will explain. Uh, typically, well, we know that master plans are advisory documents and typically language that states the county shall be required to, to take an action that relates to the caucus um, isn't, isn't supported. And because this is an advisory document, it's not a regulatory document. And sh the, the word shall is typically included in a regulatory document. So my recommendation was to poll shall that the county shall be required. Uh, it puts, I think, some undue pressure on the county. It sounds as though there was an unfortunate uh, event that occurred that, that uh, uh, resulted in this language. But I think there may be situations where the county um, for safety purposes does need to take action and for whatever reason um, shouldn't be held up by a requirement um, that that they consult with the caucus. Well, consulting shall consult with the caucus, I think is the, or should, should consult with the caucuses, I think the language that I suggested as a replacement. And I think that's more appropriate for the reasons I stated. And there's no reason to believe that that unfortunate incident will not be repeated, by the way. <laughs> my, the, circumstances, the circumstance definitely, uh, I understand why the, that language resulted uh, from that circumstance, but it's just not typically language that, that we include in, in these advisory documents. And I think it, there may be circumstances where it puts the county in a, in a position that it shouldn't be in. Yeah, I, I understand your logic that it's advisory and recommended in nature. So the word shall probably fit in that. 
I know I was I was thinking um, that you were fortunate. I think Michael, you saw it happening. Yep. Is that right? And and so it was fortunate that you were there, that you had the nerve to speak up. We haven't ever questioned that, but that it was happening in the daytime. And it this reminds me of Bob Lewis used to say to me that Americans don't believe in things that happen underground or things that are invisible or things that happen at night. And <laughs> you know, if it, if it happens at, at night, that will be a problem. But maybe yeah. before this is broad, this is the thing. I'm sorry, Chelsea. Oh, I'm sorry. This didn't in case somebody got the impression this didn't happen at night this was a right this was the trees were ribboned and picked out a long time ago correct it was, yeah I mean, right. there was a lot of discussion on our end with the county about those trees so we uh, i think we felt that uh we had been heard and uh so forth Thanks, David. And it sounds like a question where I could comment on actually because Ellen makes a good point. You put um mandates of the county staff in a master plan that's advisory and recommendational in nature. Or or can't you just say that it, it needs to be referred to the caucus? Well, and that is that what's and that's, that's, the that's basically the change. Well, that it the caucus recommends that uh these actions be that the that the caucus be consulted, the caucus be that the caucus be aware of these changes and they and referred on on the actions that are proposed. That's basically the change that I recommended. Just uh, it, one comment on Suzanne Kasky's original question regarding the low flow fixtures. Okay. Um, there is no such policy in the current plan. Yeah. The word fixture, plumbing, low flow, or efficient don't occur in the plan. Yeah, I was I couldn't find it either. So we must have dropped it, but I'd say we did that incidentally. So is there a way in this what would be the process for putting it back, Tim and and county? Um, it's an yeah. editing error. Uh, that is an editing error. And I, I think we can just literally uh we'll pull the language from from the last plan and run it by you to make sure it's accurate and up to date and and bring it back under the residential standards section okay can we on our motion make that change just yeah. like we're going to make a change on the incompatibility of the short-term venues mm -hmm. in the special review paragraph yes yeah. special review table yes change it from low to low to efficient mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but so i think if the commission wants to add the word required in the in the plan, they have you have the ability to do that. I was just looking at the road maintenance, maintenance and management plan for Pickett County about this particular issue. It says tree and shrub trimming should be done judiciously. That means you gotta go to court. It does say whole tree or shrubs may be removed, but only when no other method will correct the, the problem. Mm -hmm. But I think if you want to make that recommendation that there should be a requirement of notice to the caucus, that's fine. The requirement cool. of notice to the caucus is is not the language that they propose, but I but it is I think that is appropriate language. We can clean that up in the motion as well. Yeah. Sure. Just referral to the caucus. Do we have consensus then among the and as to how we're gonna handle that? When it comes time to make the motion, I suggested language. I, I'm just going to ask Ellen, how do you have it worded in the current exhibit A? How do we fix it? Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can go to that. I, I think it says revised request rather than require. County right now, it will. It, it, it read the county shall seek approval from the caucus before mm -hmm. removing mature trees. And the red line, I guess, from Ellen was the county should consult with right. the caucus before removing. Okay, so we keep the should? Or do we change it to require? 
I love the plan. It depends on who's making the motion. <laughs> All right. Thoughts on from any other commissioners? I guess just uh, one alpha thought would be uh, at the time, I think GR did go in front of the county commissioners in this specific case. And that the the area of concern is an area of frequent accents, accidents. Um, and sorry, Jeffrey Woodruff, and I do live in the planning area, um, full disclosure. Um, and so that you know, from Mike's point, they were uh, flagged or or um, ribbon. Um, it was brought to the county commissioners. In this case, I don't see why going back to the master plan, it, the that the caucus couldn't also be a referral body, much like in land use cases. So. I would say it would not extend the duration. The you know, GR went into the OCC, so it was a, a multiple week process. So I don't think the caucus would delay or in any way harm the health, safety, and welfare of residents. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and, and this caucus is very good with land use referrals um, and I think would be good with tree referrals, <laughs> tree removal referrals. Well said. I would, I would support. Um, Required. Um, require a referral require, to the caucus. Require a referral, which again the caucus uh, would receive and would respond to in, uh, in a timely fashion. And I'm I'm fine with that yeah. change. And that sounds like what the caucus wants. So that sounds good to me too. So when it comes time to make the motion, let's not forget that. But we all talked about it just now. Um any other questions from Suzanne yeah. about I have some more. Joe. So, would you like yes, I have a couple of kind of questions that comment. Um, so on the residential development section four, the maximum house size limitation should we consider how is this going to dovetail with the growth committee um, recommendations, which will assuming they go forward as they're talking about now, you have these areas A, B, C, D, E. And you know, in this caucus area, you have end of pavement, which I think is C, and you get the end, end of pavement, and these numbers are going to be a lot higher than what's in the um, in the recommendations, at least that are coming out of the growth committee. But wouldn't the the strongest chart, what's the word, most restrictive? Yeah, most restrictive would be, would apply. It would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that was just that that, that one comment. Um, let's see what else I have. Um, in the um, again in section four on visual impacts to be assessed from Snowmass Creek Road, Cabo Creek Road, East Sopras Creek Road, and neighboring parcels. I'm just questioning. I guess what does that mean? And neighboring parcels. In other words, when you have your scenic foreground, you know you're going from the road. And can you see it from the road? Now are we saying, oh, if I can see it from, if the neighbor can see it, then there's mm -hmm. some regulatory control over that. Just a question. I'm not saying whether I like that or don't like it or or whatever, but I just wonder about that particular language. Visual impacts should be assessed from neighboring parcels. Definitely more restrictive than what is in the code today. We don't, the code does not require that today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I don't know if the caucus would like to respond. Was this based on a, on a specific case uh, that that resulted in, in this specific language? Or do you want to clarify as to what, why you went so far as to suggesting that that this, this recommendation, which is more restrictive than the code today, was included? And keep in mind that sometimes the next one that speaks loses. <laughs> the Nate, and we're talking specifically about the reference to Nate visual impacts um, uh, assessed from the rows that you outline and neighboring parcels. I can, I will offer some, my colleagues may um, have a different example in mind. Before I, as I understood our conversations around this, the um, example we were refer that that was up for people occurred in a part of the caucus that is now part of the upper snowmass creek caucus and it's on the um ranch was it called lazy o ranch across the street and there was a big 
white house constructed um, with people having asserted that the owners, as I recall, asserting to the board that they would use visually appropriate materials that blended in with the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of discussion with the owner's representatives and the caucus about um, what that means and how pleased we were to hear that. And then the house went up a sort of stark white mausoleum. And um, there was a lot of feeling burned, not you know, not by the county, but just by a process that had where that we thought we had been really clear about appropriate materials. And some of the complaints about that house came from that same neighborhood. So I think that this language is an attempt to recognize the appropriateness, visual appropriateness of a building with respect to, you know, impacts on neighbors. And, um, and I don't, and, and I don't know where else it came from, but maybe these guys do. So it's, it is more restrictive, but I, I it, yeah, I'm, well, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it, okay. frankly. I think that you know, we don't really have that mechanism of code right now, except right. for maybe like the solar glare provisions or something like that. Um, but I'll keep moving. So then um, also the, uh, there was a comment here on uh, net zero energy consumption for all new and remodeled houses. Um, and I guess the question then is, what's a remodeled house? Do they think in the actual plan, it says something like significantly remodeled. Um, but again, that's also something the growth committee is going through. When does a remodel trigger right. these types of, you know, whatever net zero compliance? Um, again, I'm just pointing that one out and um, see if anybody has any concern about whether we should have some, you know, when does a remodel trigger something like this? I mean, I think, I think that, you know, what, what's the county doing 40%? Maybe that's the city. We did, yeah, we don't even have that now. I mean, in terms of, like, we don't have- Right, so on that's right, that's city, right? right. right. City right. considers a 40% or more remodel would be a demo, and then it kicks in the restrictions on demos, but again, different in the city, so. So this is a general, this is a recommendation and and it may end up being subject to however we uh, define remodeled as a result of the growth committee work. Correct. Right now, is that where 500 square feet comes in and it would, according to the growth committee? I don't think the growth committee's pinned it down either yet in terms of what is right. what is the remodel. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, I'm sorry, Suzanne. I don't I don't think that we've made we've we've made a decision on this term yet. And then you run into issues like, okay, if I'm just remodeling the interior of my house and the nothing's changing on the exterior, no change in the footprint, is that a remodel or is it, you know, probably. I to be determined, I think. Can I I'm, looking at, I'm actually was looking at the memo, but it, it's under the section four residential development criteria or visual. Thank you. And yeah. in the memo, it's on page two. Uh, it's the last bullet under section subparagraph E. Or it's in page, on page five of the. Of the uh, thanks. The plan. Okay, so let me just keep going. Then. So, um, in the special review standards, um, the hydroelectric production um, is the place like somebody's got a creek that goes through their property um, or a ditch that goes through their property, rather. A creek, I can understand, you know, you're you regulating hydroelectric production from a creek. But is that is that intended to apply to like any any hydro um, generation facility, even if it's completely on private property and you know is running through a ditch, for example? Or I'm guessing that Chelsea may be able to uh, <clears throat> help us on on what was intended by the caucus uh, for hydroelectric production in terms of scale location. Not to yeah, I, help Chelsea. Are you talking Chelsea Brundage? I 
Um, I think w there was some conversation around people who were doing really innovative, innovative things on their ranches in particular, doing micro hydro that allows them to manage water and generate electricity at the same time. And there's a lot of support for that kind of hydroelectric. I think that this was, this refers to concerns about um, projects that would back water up. So you could have a run of a river or a run of a creek, kind of micro, you're gonna have a micro hydro situation in any case, because Capitol Creek is what it is, but, and, and, and it's tributaries. But I think this was more concern about any hydroelectric development that would threaten the riparian and you know riverine habitat qualities of Capitol Creek because it would obstruct flows and back up water and change therefore change temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Um, was there any thought about special review for solar? Or was it decided that solar really doesn't need to be triggered by this or not? Sure. So What's the current I guess additional recommendation? I mean, we have what we have in the code today, so it doesn't sound Remind like that was anything they recommend. Depends on the size of the changes and how many kilowatts it's right. Generated. You know, larger okay. will require I, more review. I, think you them, I guess. Um, oh, I had a question. Um, I'm not that familiar with the area, but where is Cow Camp? <laughs> Way, way at the uh, at the upper end of Capitol Creek. The, the trailhead that is most heavily used. Right. The, the you can't go anywhere from there unless you're on foot. Okay. You can go further if you have extreme high clearance and low low. Um, you know the, the macho vehicles can get beyond there, but but that's where most people park. Right. But they have to cut down trees to do that. No, ma'am. No. <laughs> is that on, is that on uh, BLM or Forest Service land or is it county? Camp. Forest Service. Forest, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Same thing with Hay Park. Where's Hay Park? Mm -hmm. right. Correct. Hay That's Park. also Forest Service. Hay Park is is actually not the correct name for that. It's a Hale Park, Hay Park Trailhead. And that's that's where when you go up Capitol Creek, uh, when you drive up there. You'll see the uh, the outfitters' horse trailers will be uh, staged from that point. That's yeah, good. Okay, thanks. Um, next comment, I guess, kind of a combination of questions and comments on the on the what was it? Oh, the noise pollution. So um, I think this related to special events. No more than sixty dBA after eleven p.m. I think that doesn't it. Noise ordinance already required to be 55 once once you get dusk. Well, that you put that in the code. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the code is actually 50 at night and 55 during the day, and the caucus should adjust it lower. That's what my thought was. Yeah, because if you're yeah, for two or three dBA after 11 p.m., that's like it already exceeds the, the noise ordinance. So, so Suzanne can answer, but chapter six. Paragraph 36. Um, it's 50 at night and 55 during the day. And the critical point, I think it's not covered in the plan, but it, it will become prescient, is as more people heat and cool with pumps, not just outside the party conversation, pumps are about 50 um, dBA. So it's this is a critical part of the plan, especially in subdivisions, as everyone heats and cools now. I, I think. I, th I think we uh, we were probably uh, under the impression that the county's uh, requirement was at 60 decibels uh, at the property line. If that if that is not the case, then I, uh, I I I can assure you that we would support the county's yeah. uh, limits on that. Definitely. Yes, definitely. There also, we, we, we have one right? call the sheriff yeah. to come yeah. out there. He'll be there maybe the two or three hours later. <laughs> uh -huh. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do we need to fix that in our mm -hmm. okay, Thank you. You're keeping time. It's actually in two sections, though. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Noise pollution and plus special events. Okay. I was uh -huh. going to say that noise thing. This is create a cause of action for a neighbor who catches you at like 70 decibels, does it? If you're not, unless you're violating the actual code, I guess. So I'm not very good with the noise regulations but my understanding is it's really the levels are set and it's over a period of like a 15 minute yeah. time so it's you, not just like one people, yeah. really so loud fair. thing it has to be over you know over that uh, some certain time period that it would exceed that limit um to violate the the standard um jeffrey's nodding i'm like he's, he's probably read it more recently than i have so um and, and just at Aspen's at 50, so again, you know, we're in, you're in 6,000 or 3,000 square foot lots. If they're at 50, we should be at 50 in, in the county on, you know, on, on 45,000 square foot lots. So it's, a, it's the right number. And I'm nodding my head saying, yeah, we should be stricter in this plan um, and meet, you know, the current county standards for daytime and nighttime. We had a bit, we had a bad situation. Uh, a couple of years ago um, that um, uh, I, I am, I will tell you that uh, if the county's uh, standards are more strict than what we happen to put in the master plan, uh, I, I please put it back to what the county requires because it, um, and I did call a sheriff and he did come, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was just a very bad scene. Understood. Um, thanks for your feedback, Joe. Um, thanks, Jeffrey. Would you like to ask questions or make comments about that work? Um, so one comment as a neighbor and as someone who's watched the plan evolve for the past couple of years, um, fantastic updates. Um, thank you for solving house size. And, and reach a consensus as a neighbor and as a planning area. Um, and thank you for distinguishing um, snow cap versus upper. I know that was a, a five plus year battle. So congratulations on that. Um, I also want to commend you on uh, the inclusion of the dark sky initiative. And I know Martha's work, I think is fantastic. And I'd love to see you bring it forward in at either at or before you bring the 5750 overlay. Um, I think the community solar changes, the house size changes, and the energy use changes, um, you know, should all be commended. And obviously, you know, I know you mentioned low tech, but, um, you know, the congratulations on the study and the work that you've done there. Um, my only comment really is both for the county as well as the master plan. And it's sort of, uh, I don't know if this will be a rabbit hole, but in 2023, we, we talk about equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion. Um, in everything that we do. And it's the only thing that seems a little, um, maybe suspect's the wrong word, maybe that's too harsh, but it's, it's um, I'm concerned that on the one hand, we say as a community that seasonal and permanent, permanent housing, permanent employee housing is a special review. And then in another section, we say there should be no multifamily homes, condominiums, apartments, townhomes, or trailer homes. Um, and so I'm just, I'm worried about that sort of mixed message of the zone type is there that would decide what goes on that piece of land. Um, it would require a zoning change if, for example, you were going to come in and start a mobile home park, um, you know, from an AR-10 or an RS-30. So I guess the question is, does that um, line within residential development need to be there um, uh, again, given sort of the table and the special review uh, status. And so it's, it's, you know, a question both for staff as well as the drafters. And it's on page four slash 10. Um, are we being too restrictive, I guess, would be the question. It's the, the fourth bullet up from the bottom of page four in the plan. It seems like the non-inclusive part of this plan. I, you know, I can, I can just begin by saying that historically in the rural portions of the yeah. county, affordable housing has been, uh, has been developed as caretaker dwelling units, uh, okay. detached single family yeah. unit or attached. 
And uh, that's been what has right. been considered to be acceptable in the rural areas within the rural caucus areas as a general rule. So, uh, so I, there's not necessary, you could move forward with the recommendation for housing as a special affordable, perm affordable temporary and permanent housing <laughs> um, as a special review use. And if you believe that dense, you know, it should not be in a, in a multifamily um, um, building, you know, I, I don't know that you've got a conflict there unless you believe the density, more density to accommodate that kind of housing is appropriate. And if the caucus thinks that it is appropriate in certain zones or that rezoning to accommodate that kind of density is appropriate, then, you know, then there is a conflict. And and my follow one question then is it's sort of you know vis a vis SB twenty three two thirteen, and this plan doesn't address. I'm not. Where, I'm. I'll take multifamily off, but it doesn't even address ADUs or CDUs, which I agree. I mean, even late, you know, lazy O is characterized by a primary residence and an ADU or CDU, um, and I'm just. It's interesting that it's omitted um, from the plan. I don't recall any discussion on our part of ADUs, uh, and we probably should have uh, discussed it. Uh, and may, yeah, maybe we should maybe we should discuss it in the future. And just by the way, for what it's worth, uh, I'm in an APCHA house myself, and, and I'm a strong advocate of of affordable housing. I was one of the people that started the Pitkin Housing Authority, that was a precursor to APCHA. Uh, a very long time ago, uh, and it it seems that good planning dictates that dense affordable housing be an existing uh, corridors uh, uh, and existing uh, dense areas. Uh, there will be controversy wherever anybody proposes any affordable housing in the valley, but it seems like it ought to be near bus stops. Mm -hmm. Typically, the, the argument is that the more dense housing, as Michael said, is, is appropriate, close to infrastructure and employment centers uh, and services that exist. So for the rural areas, typically, it has taken, it is, that kind of housing has been developed as, as you said, as CDUs or, or uh, yeah, CDUs. And I think a consideration for the caucus Right, and it may be in a further conversation is right. The CDUs we have today um, aren't required to be rented. Right. You know, I mean, that's a big, so it, it's available. It's great. Some people do use them, put employees in them, rent them. They're not required to. Um, it's not supposed to be your guest house. Um, but again, it, 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 it provides a limited supply. Um, I think where we've also seen it and the county's policies speak to it, but our code doesn't so well, is the provision of on-site housing. And we've seen it a lot with the ranches. I mean, McKay Branch does have deed restricted units on that, um, but we've seen you know that request showing up more as people are really going, right, clearly we're in a crisis, but how do we find those right? We might not wanna create big multifamily complexes out in the rural area, but if there are agricultural operations or whatever that might be that have a need for employees, yeah. How can we allow for that? So um, that's, I guess I would read into that statement about a special review for seasonal and permanent employee housing, tying in more you know, to a specific like, right? A, a, a business, an agricultural operation may have you know, a requirement or a need for that. Um, but, but yeah, I think something, a, a good conversation for the caucus to have as I think everyone in the county is trying to have that conversation as well. Well, yeah, the comment there is going to be yet another study group starting tomorrow on affordable housing. Okay. As kind of a spinoff from the Climate Action Committee. I think it starts at four o'clock. There's probably the memos on the is on the website. Um, and it's a you know, in my view, one of our overarching goals has always been to keep the rural part of the county rural, keep the urban part of the county urban and not have this kind of density. I think that there's clearly a need for the ranch manager on some of these big properties so you don't have people that are driving in and so on. Um, 
But in the past, I mean, even, you know, we don't have accessory dwelling units in the county. They're called, uh, we have EDUs and CDUs. And EDUs even have been, I think, frowned upon in the past. Um, and I know there's been a lot of um, tension, if you want to call it that, between the city and then what the county contributes to affordable housing projects. But in my view, the big difference is the city, by law, is allowed to have a real estate transfer tax. Counties are not allowed to have a real estate transfer tax, so the county really doesn't have a funding mechanism for housing, for affordable housing that the city does. You know, the city's whatever got their, you know, their real estate transfer tax. So those are some issues I think that are going to probably come up in this in this next study group. And and I guess to go back to your question, I don't know that there's necessarily a conflict between those two sections in the plan based on the conversation that we've. Just had. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate the spam plan. Yeah. So that it it would go through special review. It is in the table. I'm comfortable with the language. So, and again, part of my question is looking at um, where the Democrats are going. Sorry, where the state is going in the next eight days. Right. Well, I think 213 pretty much has been gutted at this point. They're backing off on that. Uh, you know, the override of local housing or local zoning is also I think going down in this legislature and, okay that's another just a note regarding existing zoning the only AH zoning in the whole caucus area is OB Joyful where Michael is yes. and those are all single family okay. and yeah. Okay, well, thanks for uh, everyone's comments. Uh, the other commissioners addressed my notes, there, so I don't have any questions right now for discussion. Um, so I think it's appropriate to open the public hearing now. Um, so we're in, which is now officially open. Um, so Bonnie, if you're there and you can tell whether there's members of the public, I don't see any in this room. Um, but if no, you'd like to comment. Yeah, sorry. Um, the only attendee we have is Jill, and um, I believe she already asked her questions, but I'm more than happy to um, unmute her again if you'd like, but she is our only attendee right now. Jill, do you have any additional questions or comments? No, I don't. Okay, and that's all we have. That was a very brief public hearing. I feel like we almost should just sit for a second and meditate on our thoughts. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if, 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 may, may I add uh, a thanks to you all? Uh, you've obviously put a lot of time in, in speaking from direct experience, though, many years ago. I know you guys put a huge amount of time into this, and you, you've obviously studied our master plan closely, and we, we, uh, we thank you very, very much for that. Thank you, Michael. Um, all right, well, then I'm going to close the public hearing um, and entertain any additional uh, uh, commissioner discussion before or entertain a motion uh, on the pending resolution that's on our agenda tonight. Um, we have a list that's been going of fixes to exhibit A. Anybody want to review that? Um, see if we're all in agreement to the the proposed minor adjustment to the existing exhibit. Well, if there's no more discussion, I'll make a motion. Please go ahead. So I would move that the planning and zoning commission adopt the amendments to the um, adopt the 2023 master plan for the valleys of Capitol Creek and Lower Snowmass Creek, um, and forward that on to the board of county commissioners with couple minor changes. So these would include adding the special event venue to the table and special review uses in the column that says incompatible. Um, I would propose that we revise the provision on referrals to the caucus for removing trees from county lands and rights of way to state that um, the county is required to seek caucus input to that extent. 
that we would, um, the third item is amending the uh, provisions on noise to be uh, consistent with the existing uh, county requirements, which is 60, or I'm sorry, 50 DBA. Um, that we add back the clause in section 12 on recommending or encouraging homeowners to install state-of-the-art efficient plumbing fixtures. And I think that's it. Let's show something No, I had four items. You covered them all. And that was a great motion made by Joe. Is there a second? A second. I second. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a motion and a second. Um, two seconds. Uh, two seconds, yes. For um, a, res a resolution of the County Planning and Zoning Commission adopting amendments to the 2018 Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus Master Plan and certifying the 2023 Master Plan for the Valleys of Capital Creek and Lower Snowmass Creek to the Board of County Commissioners of Pickens County. Um, so I'll have it with subject to the four um, um, uh, revisions uh, enumerated by Joe. Um, I'll go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Joe? Yes. Jeffrey? Yes. Zachary? Yes. And Jasmine? Yes. And myself, I vote in favor. Uh, so we have a unanimous approval of the resolution with the adjustment. Uh, congratulations to the Snowcap Caucus for uh, your hard work and to staff for helping see this through. Uh, through Make it better, and in all these improvements, I, I assume we'll we'll see you again soon in a proposed land use code amendment. Uh, hopefully, to be consistent with this master plan. So, thanks, guys. Thank you all very much. Good yeah. night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you. And then, yeah, thank you. Earlier in the meeting, we talked about our next meeting. We don't have one on May 16th, and then we have another one on the 6th. It'll probably be in the library to hear the growth committee's um, proposed plan uh, joint with the BOCC. I'll remind everybody that, to hear that it starts at 4, not at 5 um, on the 6th. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Or I'll make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> yes. Okay, Jeff. Okay, well then, all in favor of adjourning? Raise Aye. your hand. Okay, looks like we're unanimous. Good night, everyone.